I instantly fell to my knees in front of him. And I knew that I was falling in the presence of God. Crystal McVeigh wasn't having a dream. She had died and says she woke up in heaven. And it was this God that had run from my whole life. Her journey away from him began when she was molested at three years old. I grew up believing that I was disgusting and broken and filthy. Crystal went to church with her mother. When she was eight, she accepted Christ and was baptized. She hoped that would cleanse her from the guilt and shame of being molested. But the abuse continued until she was 12 years old. I decided that there were two options. Either one, there was a God and he didn't love me for whatever reason because he hadn't stopped the things that had happened in my life. He hadn't saved me or two, there was no God. In her teen years, Crystal started using drugs and alcohol and was promiscuous. By the time she was 21, Crystal was a divorced mother with two children. Finally, at 28, she settled down and married Virgil and they had twins. 10 months later in December 2009, doctors performed a routine procedure that triggered pancreatitis. She had complications and ended up with a 110 degree fever. Her mother, Bonnie, came to the hospital. She didn't look right. She looked swollen to me. They had uh, put her on a pain pump. I felt very calm and very peaceful. I remember opening my eyes and seeing my mom sit at the chair at the foot of my bed. And I told her that I loved her. She felt cold. And when I looked up, her lips were blue and she wasn't breathing. And I turned around and her face was black. And I just started screaming, she's dead, she's dead. The nurse told me, she said, you need to leave, you need to, and I told her, I'm not going anywhere. Code blue, we need the crash card in here, quick. For the next nine minutes, doctors and nurses tried to resuscitate Crystal. About that time, Crystal's husband, Virgil, arrived. Everything went through my mind. I didn't know if she was alive. I didn't know if she was dead. I know why they didn't want me in there. It's violent. And so her nine minutes in heaven were my nine minutes in hell. While the team worked to revive her, Crystal says she was in heaven. The first thing I remember becoming aware of was that I was still me. And I was still the me who had just told my mother that I loved her and died. And I was very aware of the fact that I had just died. But I was also the me that had existed from the moment that God had created me. The light came to me as if I was in the middle of the tunnel, yet it went on for eternity. I remember being so at peace and so bathed in this light and this love. She knew she was in the presence of God. I didn't see a face. I didn't see any features other than this beautiful light. And words like amazing and perfect and beautiful, they fall so drastically short. I could not get enough of him. I could not breathe enough of him in. I could not get close enough to the light and the light was all over me. Then Crystal says she tried to ask God a question. I wanted to know why he didn't love me or why he lets bad things happen. And yet as I stood in front of him and I faced him and I fell to my knees and I raised my hands, the question I called out to him was why didn't I do more for you? Because in an instant, he revealed his true self to me, which is love. I had never truly worshiped God ever in my entire life but I fell in front of him and I worshiped him. And as I lay there in worship in awe of this creator, I remember saying, I could worship you for eternity. Crystal traveled with God down a tunnel toward the gates of heaven. She noticed a small child ahead of her. She wore a bonnet on her head and she had a little white basket in her hand. I watched her pick her basket up and dip it in the light. She would scoop it and then she would dump the light out as if it was water and the light would cascade out of her basket and she would throw her head back and she would laugh. And every time she laughed, every time she moved, my spirit began to swell as if it was a balloon with love. 
God revealed to Crystal that she was seeing herself at three years old. She was me at the moment that the enemy stepped into my life and whispered that I was worthless, that I was broken, that I was disgusting, that I got everything I deserved. She was the three-year-old that heard that God didn't love her, that he had abandoned her, that he had forsaken her, and that God didn't exist. And he allowed me to know that he had allowed me to look through his eyes and to see the truth. And the truth set me free. All of Crystal's doubts about the existence of God and his love for her faded away. I remember what it felt like to be in chains. And I remember the moment that he took them from me. I was free and he didn't just say, Crystal, I love you. He allowed me to experience his love and his love almost made me explode. Then Crystal says she heard her mother calling her name. And I said, can I go tell her that I'm okay? And he said, the choice is up to you. And I turned away from this light to go and find where her voice was coming from. And when I turned, he said, tell them what you can remember. And I remember calling back, I'll remember everything and I'll be right back. And I looked down through the floor of this tunnel of heaven. And it was as if I was looking at a million shimmering diamonds. And the instant that I noticed those diamond-like substance, I was back in my body. Krista woke up in the hospital surrounded by the medical team. And I turned to my mom, who was crying, and I told her that I was in heaven, that I was with God, and that I was in the most beautiful light, and that I was okay. Krista left the hospital eight days later. She'll tell you she left there a different person. My life has completely changed. Uh, the person that died in that hospital room was not the same person who came back in so many different ways. But the difference is, is that I know that there is a, a God who loves us. I know that there is a Father who really is listening to us, who really is holding us. Crystal has written about her journey in her New York Times bestselling book called Waking Up in Heaven. People often ask me, what is your message? What message did he send you back with? And it is so simple that it just doesn't matter who we are, where we've been, what's been done to us, what we've done, that his love is so vast and so great that it encompasses everything. And that we have that love, not for anything that we've done to deserve it, but because he finds us worthy and because he gives us the choice to choose him. Brittany Bacon Hester was a precocious three-year-old. She knew Bible scripture. She was singing in church all by herself. Just loved life, full of life. That all changed one morning when her mother, Jamie, heard a strange noise coming from Brittany's room. Like a gurgling, like a can't breathe, struggling noise. I immediately just picked her up and said, oh God, touch her. Brittany was having a grand mal seizure. Her parents rushed her to the doctor and Brittany was diagnosed with epilepsy, a condition all too familiar to Jamie. I understood it because I had them myself. So I thought she'd be just like me. I'd get her on medicine and everything would be all right. It wasn't that simple. Brittany's doctor started her on the first of many medications, but the seizures just got worse. She couldn't set up and she couldn't look at me to focus. And when I call her name, she was just totally out of it, just totally gone. As a mother, you feel so responsible. You, they're, they're your flesh, they've, they've lived in you. And, and when she would pull at me to help her, and I couldn't. I blame myself a lot. You know, I thought, well, I've given my daughter this sickness. Over the course of the next two years, Brittany's illness took its toll on her parents. Physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, even financially. Uh, one bottle of medication would cost $50, and we couldn't afford it. She needed 24 hour a day care. I mean, there was, it didn't matter if it's night or day, the seizures continued. 
Brittany had to wear a helmet to protect her head from injury, while her parents turned to God's Word for comfort. God gave me my promise in Psalms 37, 4 and 5. He said, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. God said, Don't look at what you see. Look at what you don't see. Tell me and speak what you want. I put her in the car and I started down the road and I ended up at a school playground. And um, I said, God, that's what I want. I want my little girl back, normal, like those kids I see that's running and playing. And he said, it will come to pass. The doctors, on the other hand, gave a different report. She had been in the hospital for almost three weeks and they had tried everything. They ran one more brain wave, and they said her whole brain seizuring. So we can't even take out the part of the brain or put a shunt in or to help her. There's nothing else we can do. They just said, uh, just let her go home where she'll be more peaceful in her own bed. I just knew she was close to death. And I thought, Lord, it's not time because you said that he would bring it to pass. Jamie spent a sleepless night praying for her daughter's recovery. That morning, Brittany began to speak. She kept saying, Jesus, Jesus. And I could tell by the look on her face and her eyes that, well, she's responding and she hasn't responded or talked to me for a good year at all. So, you know, when she could look at me and describe Jesus, you know, with um, eyes like fire and the bright lights and the angels. Who could tell a five-year-old child that? I knew that she had encountered Christ. When they took Brittany back to the doctor. They were amazed. They just looked at her and pretty much just said the same thing, that uh, we see the healing in her eyes. And uh, they knew that they just, one of the nurses said, it's a higher power. And I said, yeah, it's Jesus, he healed her. A couple of months after Brittany was healed, Jamie began having headaches. My doctor thought it was just the stress I went through. But every time I'd take my medicine, my headaches would, would be stronger. Jamie's neurologist performed an EEG and found out why. He said, a miracle's taken place. Your brainwave's now clear. Would you like to come off your medicine? And uh, sure enough, I did. And I uh, have been seizure-free and drug-free for uh, 18 years. Brittany is now in college, studying to be a psychologist. She still loves to sing in church. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. And she still remembers her encounter with Jesus Christ. He just had the glory of God shown upon him and um, the angels were all around him, front, behind, everywhere, there was angels. And um, you just, it was just wonderful. You just felt so peaceful and so at ease. And I, I, all I can say is there's nothing like it. And I've never experienced anything like it on this earth. Today, both Brittany and her mother are completely healthy. I had heard from God and God kept his promise. And he will, and he does. I, I always felt different being a Muslim, but it was kind of a good thing. It always gave me the confidence that I was following the right faith. I always believed that Allah was God, but growing up in high school, I wanted to have fun like I, I saw everybody else having fun. And it's like, what's fun about not smoking pot? What's fun about not drinking? What's fun about not partying? It's like what everybody does to have fun and people, it's fun. <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to do that. And later on when I become a, a parent and I'm raising children, then I'll be a good Muslim. I always had a love for music and I had a passion for music. I really, really wanted to just do something in the music business, something in the music. I just, um, I just had a love for it. The day that Eddie met me, the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to take Khalid on the road with you. I'm going to save him. And it was, it's kind of funny because it was right after 9-11 had happened and Eddie was not trying to take no Muslim into his, <laughs> into his ministry. I thought this was my big break. I thought it was my chance to be fair. I could care less about Jesus, but I wanted to learn what I could from Eddie and then just go and do my own thing. 
First place we went to was Nashville, Tennessee. My friend David got bitten on his hand by a bug or an insect or something, and his hand starts swelling up, and I was thinking maybe we need to get some type of cream or go to a doctor or something. It didn't look like it was getting any better. The mother of the house we're staying with came up to David and said, you know, I'm gonna pray for you. I wanna believe that God will heal your hand, that Jesus is gonna heal your hand. And I thought, this lady has gotta be out of her mind. Jesus healing a hand, I said, that's the stuff they do on TV. It's like, <laughs> give me a break, who believes that crap? Right in front of my face, his, the swelling goes away. And the, you couldn't even tell he was, had anything wrong with his hand. I had an infection in my mouth. My wisdom teeth were growing in crooked. But I also like ha had an infection around my wisdom teeth, which is like pain on top of pain. I, like, I didn't get any sleep ever. Uh, it had been going on for like a good two weeks of just nonstop pain. So I walked up to her, I said, can you do for my mouth what I saw you do for his hand? And when she started praying for me, it was like gone. I knew it was gone. I just needed a minute to come to grips with, with, with what just happened. I remember sitting in the chair after she prayed for me. I sat down, I go, oh my God, my whole life is gonna change. Of course, everybody says, you know, are, do, do you feel any pain? Do you, are you healed? I said, I, I've been having medicine all day long. Just let me go to bed. I'll sleep on it and I'll tell you in the morning. So I ran downstairs and they had these sugar molasses cookies and I started shoving them in my mouth, you know, letting it marinate and trying to push it around in there, trying to agitate it, get, get the pain working. And there was absolutely no pain and I began to really start freaking out. I started, and I, uh, I started punching myself in the face, <laughs> trying to make some type of pain in my teeth and my face. And I realized that Jesus was God. I never knew that that God would be involved in a human life so personal that he would set them free and deliver them and, and that he would care enough to, to do that and intervene. It was a month after I got healed. We went to this conference in Alabama and it was the first time I heard the voice of the Lord and, and the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, if you wanna know if this is real, get up and see for yourself. I just lifted my hands and I closed my eyes and I just said, okay, Lord, we, just show me whatever you want to show me. And uh, they began to pray for me and my knees just turned like rubber and I just fell and hit the ground. I couldn't stand. I said, okay, Lord, for real, God, Jesus, whoever. I said, I really want to, I really want to know you. I really want you to give me all that you got. And so I just raised my hands and with nobody touching me, I just, nobody laying hands, I, I just fell over like a ton of bricks. I felt like my, I left my body and I kept going up and up like through the roof. And I, f I feel like the Lord took me to, to heaven. The best way for me to describe it was that if love had a color, it's all that I saw. I have never experienced or felt a love like I had and a peace that I had felt in that moment. I just had an encounter um, with him and it didn't matter to me what he was. I knew I wanted to live for, for that God. I mean, he gave me a promise when I first gave my life to him that he was gonna save my whole family. He's gonna start with my sister, my mother, and then my father. So since then, my sister has come to the Lord. And a couple years after that encounter, my mother came to Christ. And so now they're both serving the Lord and we're just uh, believing uh, the Lord to, f to fulfill what he said he was gonna do and, and uh, go ahead and save my dad. <laughs> I, I'm just so happy that I found Christ and, I, and that I have a heavenly father who, who even, even today, I, I'm, if to be honest, I'm not good enough, but I have, a, I have a heavenly father who loves me even in my weakness. And, and that makes me good enough. Success does many things to people. To me, it brought about not only accomplishments, but it brought about pride. Every home Alan Youngblood built, he built well. I would look at myself and think that these accomplishments were absolutely all mine. Never even imagined that possibly in the background, there could have been a God who was directing my life. Alan ran a successful business constructing multi-million dollar commercial buildings and luxury mansions and everyone knew not to cross Alan Youngblood. I became a person of anger, explosive, almost to the point of danger sometimes. Anger became the thing that ruled my life in so many ways. It gave me power. 
they gave me position. And even though Alan went to church, his beliefs kept him far from God. The way I saw God was that he was a God that knew everything that I did and saw every sin that I ever committed and possibly writing them down in a book in heaven. I found it impossible to love of God who was out to get you. Then one night on New Year's Eve, Alan went to church. As he stood at the communion rail, he says his soul was transported to another place where he heard a voice that sounded like rushing waters. The scripture came to me and it says, if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you are no more than a liar and a murderer. At that moment, he repented of his sins and experienced the forgiveness of God, something he had never really felt before. Alan was then carried away to a beautiful city with a gate made of pearl. But when I walked through those gates, my mind could not even conceive what I would see. Have we read about the streets of Go? Yes, but they were different. They were suspended like a body highway with no visible means of suspension. As I neared that area, I saw cascading out of the throne of God, a massive waterfall from which I believe flows the river of life. Then Alan says he saw a friend named Jerry. Jerry had died years earlier in a fiery plane crash, but here in his vision, Jerry appeared normal wearing a blue suit. He turned and he held his hand and pointed toward the top of the platform of the throne of God. I thought, oh, am I going to see God? A few moments later, Alan says he was standing as he had been at the front of the church. Alan's wife, Barbara, remembers what happened. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> it was, you know, trouble me. I thought, oh my goodness, this is embarrassing. He's, he's uh, gone to sleep. I said, honey, I did not go to sleep. And I can't tell you what happened to me until some other time. For days after his heavenly encounter, Alan continued to be affected by what he remembered. His whole attitude was one of softness. The hard uh, look that he had was gone. Alan began to speak publicly about his experience in heaven. At one meeting, he saw the widow of his friend Jerry, the man in the blue suit that he had seen in heaven. As Alan described the scene, Jerry's widow spoke up. She revealed she had given the blue suit to the funeral director to put into the coffin, even though her husband's body had been so badly burned. That suit was the same suit Alan says he saw Jerry wearing in heaven. That's when Alan realized why he had seen his friend in heaven. To go back home, to tell one woman, there is a God, there is a heaven, there's life after death, and Jerry's there. Alan continues to tell others that heaven is real in a new book called Voice of Many Waters. God's greatest desire is, is that you know who he is and how he is and how much he loves you. It's impossible not to fall in love with him when you really begin to have that relationship. The greatest relationship you will ever know. In September 1996, Hurricane Fran slammed into the Carolinas. In the storm's aftermath, Georgia power worker Rick Moncrief was assigned to clear downed power lines in North Carolina. He was on a rooftop trying to pull a line from under a fallen tree when the line snapped. He fell backwards and landed head first on the concrete driveway. He was flown to Duke Medical Center. His wife Donna was told to prepare for her husband's funeral. I felt a lot of fear and I felt concerned and I, I, I had this every scenario going through my brain. How am I going to raise three daughters by myself? Um, I'm too young to be a widow. You name it, those kind of thoughts came through my head. Rick had several broken ribs and his brain was hemorrhaging. Ten minutes after he arrived at the hospital, he slipped into a coma. He was hooked up to a breathing machine and all kinds of machines and so I just I don't, I, I just looked at him, you know, I was like, I, I was in shock, I think. I couldn't believe that he was laying there. And the doctors were just saying, 
that it was a wait and see game. They didn't know. I believed in prayer and I knew that Jesus was the healer. In my own strength right at that moment, I didn't have that, that strength in myself to pray. And so I had believers and friends who were praying for me as well as for Rick, that we would, you know, that we would be able to come through this. The prayers continued, and by day five, Rick was still unresponsive. At least it appeared that way. I was taken into the throne room of God. It was more real than you are. It was so real, and everything was just so white, whiter than white. And I, I was on my belly, on my face before the Lord, and I saw his feet. His feet is fine burned brass. I didn't see his face. But he asked me, what do you want to do? And I kept hearing the scripture over and over. Whose report will you believe? Will you believe the report of the Lord or the believe the report of the doctors? And I said, I want to live. I want to live and declare the word of the Lord. And he stood up and he clapped his hands and he said, that's enough. And when he said, that's enough, I began immediately to come out of the coma. His doctor said Rick would never be the same again. Rick and Donna believed differently. She said, well, you're the most luckiest person in the world now that you ever came out of this coma. And you recover from this fall a little bit, but it'll be 60 months minimum, which is five years, before you will ever be 40% back. And I told her, I said, no, ma'am. I said, I don't mean any disrespect at all to you, but I said, it's not going to take that long. The Lord's going to do a quick work. During rehab, Rick says he read Psalms in the Bible, and he and Donna joined their friends and family in prayer. I was believing for the healing, and my friends were believing for the healing, because we believe by his stripes we are healed. Each day his health improved, and after just 27 days of rehab, Rick had a 95% recovery. When I came back to work at the power company in the early part of 1997, I came back to work full duty. The faithfulness of God comes to my mind. That our God, at the, at the immediate cry of our heart, will hear us, and He listens, and He's faithful. The great doctors at, at these two great hospitals did all they could do, but it was the Father's love. It was His grace. It was His compassion on me to allow me to live today and, and live these 18 years since this has happened. Rick later retired from the power company and became a pastor. He cherishes every moment he has with his wife and family and says he doesn't let a day go by without giving thanks to God for his miraculous healing. Every day is an incredible day. Every day is just, there's always a lot to be thankful for. I'm just thankful that I feel better today than I did yesterday. I'm thankful today that I'm able to stand up. I'm thankful today I don't have a, a massive headache this morning. I'm thankful today that I'm able to breathe by myself without a machine. I'm just thankful. Hawaii, the Bahamas, the Virgin Islands. These are just a few of the exotic locations where Darnisha and Scott Taylor have scuba dived. As experienced divers, they thought they were prepared for anything, but in the waters of Crystal Lake, Michigan, death lurked underwater. We got prepared, put on our gear, and we started wading out into the water. What you do is you get to a ledge. At the ledge, it drops down 50 feet. Scott and Darnisha explored the bottom of the lake for 30 minutes. The ledge is, is your marker. If you stay on the ledge, you, you're always in the right place, basically. But this day, we lost track of the ledge. And so my husband looks at my, turns around to me, looks at the compass again to try to get a bearing. And when he looks at me, he sees that my um, equipment is not working, that I've got bubbles coming out of air es escaping from someplace. When I saw the small stream, constant stream of air bubbles coming off her air hose, uh, that uh, not her breathing air hose, the, the hose that connects to her BC or buoyancy control vest and so he gestured to me to ascend to the surface so that i could fix my coupler 
and then I could also kind of see where we were in the lake. Darnisha surfaced while Scott waited for her 50 feet below. So I was trying to fix the coupler and it would not reattach. If you know anything about scuba diving, you know that you add extra weight in order to be able to stay on the bottom. So I was carrying um, at least probably um, 50 to 70 extra pounds of weight and I um, was fighting against that to stay on top of the water. At that time, I tried to start a, a clock in my mind to know that she's gonna do a safety stop, which is between three and five minutes, is standard in diving, and then she's gonna be on the surface and clasp it and then head back down. So I'm trying to, to run these numbers in my head because I know we, you know, if it goes beyond this, there's there's something wrong. We need to call off the dive. I was starting to get winded and tired. So I thought, well, before I run out of air, <laughs> let me fill out my BC manually, which is really the first thing that you're supposed to do. So I went to depress the valve to fill it up and I and no air would go in. That was like, okay, this is not going to work. So I started really feeling like I'm in trouble. So I started praying, God, please send my husband to the surface. Please let him know that I need help. Darnisha struggled for several minutes. She had no more strength to stay afloat. I remember one of my final prayers to the Lord being, okay, Father, if this is your will, then I'm gonna trust you to take care of everything that needs to be taken care of. That was the moment I shut my eyes and said, okay, Lord, just help me to swim straight. And uh, that's when I drifted off into eternity. Got up to the surface, but was kind of surprised when, um, as I went up, um, that I, you know, she was not around or not hanging on the line. I did a 360 a couple times, um, looking around. So I started looking for air bubbles on the surface. I woke up on my knees in this place that was, uh, the only way that I can describe it is it was a room, but it had no walls. It was just a wide open, bright space. It was so um, peaceful. It was very pure. In the distance, I, I could tell there was this great destination this gateway, this, 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 this place that people were entering into. I remember feeling like I was home, even though it didn't necessarily look like my, my house, it was a place that I knew I was welcomed. Darnisha saw other people in her vision, and one of them in particular caught her attention. We didn't talk though, but we communicated. And it was as if she was asking me, are you, are you coming? And I um, didn't know what to say. The anxiety started increasing there a little bit more. I started doing a spin. I started yelling, yelling her name out. Scott finally saw his wife. She was 200 yards away. He swam toward her. I kept uh, uh, popping back up to the surface to adjust my bearings to make sure I was swimming in that direction. By the time Scott reached Darnisha, she was sinking to the bottom of the lake. Everything went black. And I started reacting like, what just happened? I'm home, why are they bothering me? And that was the moment that I remembered what happened with the accident and that I had drowned. Be before that, in this peaceful place, I didn't remember any of that. I remember having to talk to myself and say, okay, I have a decision to make. And I remember actually having to specifically make the decision. Do I stay or do I come back? I heard clearly, you need to relax and let him bring you back. And so I said, okay. And I inhaled and allowed the process to happen. absolute miracle that I could I, I, that I even found her in that lake so I had her uh, my arm around her 
uh, the back and just pounding as hard as I could on her chest and uh, breathed into her mouth. And uh, that first breath, just uh, the, the first air coming back out of her lungs, wasn't her breathing yet, was just horrifying because all I could hear was the, the water gurgling in her lungs. Scott spotted a boat and he screamed for help. As soon as the boat cut its engines, the first thing I heard was prayers of all three of the people on the boat praying and, and crying out to Jesus for help. As soon as we got her up, she coughed out all the water out of her lungs um, and started breathing. Scott and Darnisha were taken to shore. He drove her to the nearest hospital 45 minutes away. After MRI tests and x-rays, Darnisha was treated and released the same day. The report that the doctor gave back was, it, it looks really great. It looks like she, it doesn't even hardly look like she had this type of an accident. There are so many people that God has behind the scenes on earth and in the heavenlies that are working for our benefit and for our good. He does not expect that um, our willpower will get us through difficult circumstances, that he understands that there is a process, that there, um, that there are emotional things that we'll have to walk through, that there are um, circumstances that we didn't foresee, that um, he is still more than capable of giving us grace to be able to get onto the other side. It's about whatever is dealt to you, that you are able to walk through it with the love and the grace of God and um, he will give you what you need in order to make it. All of a sudden, I felt, I felt this hot pierce. Then everything went black. Matthew and Nancy Botsford worked hard and played even harder. They pursued everything in life with gusto, except when it came to God. I knew God existed, but that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. But everything changed on one March night in 1992. Matthew and two sales associates were in Atlanta on business. They had just left a restaurant and had gone outside to catch a taxi when suddenly... Matthew and his friends never saw it coming. A group of men behind them were arguing when three of them pulled out 9mm Uzis and started shooting. One of Matthew's friends took a bullet to the head and died instantly. The other one was unharmed. Matthew was also shot in the head and he too died. Utter blackness. Um, incredible fear. I went to a place, what I believe was hell. Uh, it was void of anything good icy cold beyond anything words can describe. And this hand came down towards me. And as it did, it brought uh, warmth, just flooding this room, this area that I was in uh, with, with, this, with this brilliant white light. And then I, and then I felt this motion, of, I, I was being pulled upwards. I heard this voice and it said, it's not your time. Matthew was resuscitated on the scene and taken to Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta. Nancy flew in from their home state of Michigan. Her first meeting with the doctor situation. was devastating. He said, if he makes it through the night, there's a 30% chance to get through the night. After that, he'll probably be in a wheelchair. And they didn't know with the brain injury that if he'd be a vegetable or not, at that point they didn't know. And he says, and he might even have to be in an institution. Nancy took a walk down a corridor to clear her head. In front of me, I just started seeing this blackness. I just got the, the horrible news of Matthew and it was just incredible. And this blackness just started getting, in front of me just getting bigger and I just felt myself falling into this blackness. I had no control, I was just losing it. And that's when I felt this heavy hand on my right shoulder and there was nobody there. And right then I knew it was Jesus. I went straight back to Matt's room 
and he's all wrapped up and bandaged. And, and I just said, Lord, and I'm not saved, nothing. I went, Lord, bring back my husband, even if he's in a wheelchair. It doesn't matter, but bring back who he is, who his heart is, who his personality is. I promise I'll stay with him. I that promise, promise would be tested. Matthew was in a coma and flatlined several times. Nancy lived hour to hour as it seemed that one crisis followed another. But with every crisis came a glimmer of hope. It seems like every, every situation, it would be critical and then things would turn around. He was put on a kidney dialysis. They said, oh, he'll be on this for three weeks, three days. Things turned around. After 27 days, Matthew awoke from his coma. It was incredible. It was like a, being reconnected. But as soon as that connection and he woke up, I said, that's it. So the whole focus was now to get him on his feet, to, to go against the odds that he's going to be in a wheelchair, he's going to an institution. The left side of Matthew's body was paralyzed. But even worse, the damage to his brain affected his ability to think and perform even the simplest of tasks. They returned to Michigan where Matthew started rehab, trying to rebuild his body and his mind. The rehab was, it was painful. I mean, physically, it was painful. Cognitively, it was painful. I mean, I remember I would do, do simple things like uh, run the out through the alphabet in my head, you know, make sure I could go from A to Z. They were teaching me and helping me how to, to, to eat. For two and a half long years, Matthew worked through the pain with Nancy by his side. Progress was slow. He eventually left the wheelchair and walked with a cane. But recovering mentally was a much slower process. But Nancy remembered her promise to stay with Matthew through it all. Cognitively, he was not with it. He was in La La Land. And so, yeah, it was that thought of, you know, boy, I didn't sign up for this. But I remembered I made that promise, and that was stronger than what I signed up for. The Botsfords were so focused on Matthew's regimen, they all but forgot their experiences with God. There was no focus there. There was no focus. It, it was all about Matthew and, and um, get, get him, you know, more, to get more therapies. That is until they moved to Florida. One day Matthew met a neighbor while out taking a walk. And I remember kind of like looking up and saying, hey, where's a good church around here? And I was, I was just like floored me what came out of my mouth and floored my wife. I said, what? We're not looking for a church. But eventually they attended an Easter service. We just knew then. We both looked at each other and said, this is it. This is what we need. And it was this peace, this anchor, this stability it just it, it it just like took us over through the years they began to recognize God's hand in their journey today Matthew walks without the help of a cane mentally he earned a college degree and is writing a series of sci-fi children's books called Johnny Rocket all of which is pretty amazing considering the bullet is still in Matthew's head but the big miracle in this story when I was dead I didn't cry out for God, but yet he came down and with his own hand pulled me up out of hell and says, it's not your time. I mean, that's a loving God. The miracle is how God so much loved Matthew that he didn't just leave him in hell, that he brought him up. But the miracle is how he changed his heart. God exchanged his heart for Matthew's and, and gave him his own. That's the miracle. September 25th, 2012. Cops follow a tip. The man they're after is inside an apartment building. Officer Ali Perez takes the lead. I was in charge of investigating a case where the woman discovered that her two daughters were being uh, molested by her living boyfriend. As they approach, the suspect, Daniel Witzak, is waiting, armed with a high-powered rifle. He won't come to the door. Sheriff's office, open up! I mule kick the door. The door goes flying open, and I take one step, and he opens fire. First round hits me in the left arm, right here, right in the middle of my arm. Officer Perez and his partner return fire. 
The suspect is wounded but keeps shooting. Perez can't find cover. He takes more hits before he and the shooter empty their clips. It's a race to reload. I was having a very hard time coming to terms with the fact that this is where I was going to meet my end, that I was going to die right here, and I knew it, and there was nothing I could do to change it. And I expect a bullet to the head any moment, and that's when the miracle happens. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was there. I didn't see him appear, but he was in between us. He was already there when I raised my eyes, and it was magnificent. I knew one or two things was going to happen. Either one, I'm going home to the Lord, or two, I'm going home to Gracie and the kids, and either one is a win. And I said, Lord, I trust you completely. What do you want me to do with this guy? And I watched him. He picked up the feather that was in the ink bottle, and he wrote. And then he put the feather back in the ink bottle. And this note, it was the size of a three by five index card. It flies off the desk like a leaf in the wind. And I watched it with my eyes. I tracked it with my eyes. And then I came down here and it landed right here on my vest. And I pick it up and I read it. And it says, I want you to bless him. Now this, keep in mind, this is a guy that just ripped my arm almost completely off, shot a hole through my body, shot the supervisor, horribly molested these two little girls. Jesus didn't say reload and finish the job. He said, I want you to bless him. So I looked right at the, looked right at the bad guy and said, God bless you, brother. Officer Perez sees more visions before noticing Witsack staring at him. Looks at me and he asked me, would you like to crawl out to your friends now? Real, real, almost, his, man, his mannerisms changed. Now up to this point, I don't know if he sees Jesus or not. I, I have no idea, I don't know. So I said, yes. I said, yeah, I'm ready to go. Witsack helps Perez towards the front door. By now, a backup team has arrived and they start firing. Witsack retreats. Perez is left alone. And then the door opens on its own. I'm in no condition to open doors and turn handles and do all this stuff. Bad guy never made it to the door. Rescue teams at the bottom of the stairs, they never made it to the door. How did the door get opened? God open that door. Officer Perez crawls to the doorway and a member of the rescue team carries him to safety. Witsack eventually surrenders and is taken into custody. While Perez is taken to the ER to fight for his life, doctors tell his family he has no chance of survival. Everybody dropped on their knees right there and started praying and not just at the hospital, but at the Santee station and at stations all across the county. Everybody got on their knees and prayed because the word went out like fire and I'm alive because of the power of prayer. After 27 surgeries and hours of grueling physical therapy, Officer Perez testifies at Witsack's trial. He takes the opportunity to extend grace to the man who tried to kill him. Daniel Witsack is currently serving a life sentence. Ali Perez is medically retired and continues to recover, but he says he's gained far more than he's lost. I got to spend three minutes with Jesus before my day of judgment. And if I got some cuts and bruises along the way and I lose the use of my arm, it was worth it. Every heartbeat and every breath is a gift from God. Oh, I am so, so thankful. I am thankful to be here. I'm thankful for the opportunity to testify to people that he is true, that God is real, that Jesus loves us so very, very, very much. And there's an opportunity that we got to before it's too late. Get on our knees, humble ourselves before him and get right with the Lord.